So, so, so you come back to Australia, yeah. you're on a roll, you're February loving, you've been experimenting, you've got yeah. the tick off from the professor in yeah. Canada yeah. and you go to your husband, that's it. We're doing ice cream, yep, right? Yep. So, well, we're doing we're, a scalable product now. So you're doing. So, so, you, just, so you're, you're, you've gone now, nah, not doing little quantities. No, not, not going to muck around with that. Or nah, anything like I'm that. going straight to the supermarket. Yes, yes. So scaling something that's yes. massive, that's huge. And look, the upside of that was already from the very beginning. I had said to um, Benny, my husband, that if we're going to do this ice cream thing, which we're doing together. Um, it has to be to leverage my skills to give back. And yeah. that was my other dilemma is how do I do that? How's the best way to leverage what I know and what I can do to give back to the community? And so then I embarked on another separate journey, which was to understand how social enterprises work. How do people give back? What are the models? How, what works? How do you make it profitable? Um, and so that was a separate pathway. And so I started talking to experts in that space. We had a few contacts, people um, who could guide me a little bit in that space. And once I locked on to ice cream, then it became very clear straight away how I was going to give back um, for two reasons. One, ice cream manufacturing is expensive. So to set up a factory wasn't really um, available to us for a startup brand. Mm, mm, so, mm. But we're lucky that in um, Melbourne there are a lot of contract manufacturers because Victoria actually is the – uh, has the most dairy production in the country. So hence, as a result, we've got quite a lot of ice cream manufacturing as well. Lots of available contract manufacturers. Um, and so so that's the first thing. We're not spending money on equipment anymore, which if a scoop shop, we would have had to. Mm. Um, uh, and the other was, if you're doing something at scale, then your impact potentially could be more. Mm. Um, and so... I then we then settled on the model, which is what um, the product "Who Gives a Crap" toilet paper uses, um, mm -hmm. and thank you, which is we give half our profits to. Um, in this case, we settled on Oz Harvest as the charity of choice mm. because they do amazing things. They uh, do. I've, yeah, I've actually been to um, the founder. Oh, her name escapes. Ronnie me. Khan. Ronnie, I've been to one of her talks, and she's such an inspiring uh, woman on how she actually started the business, and she had a kind of a. a, a she had an epiphany as well because yeah. she was throwing away all that food in her that's catering right, business. in the catering business. And, and it, yeah. you know, so that was her drive, which is this, this, this has to be a better way. Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone has their own little epiphanies, their drivers yeah, that get 100%. them on their bike to yeah. you know, make things happen and change. Yeah. So, um, so they were exceptional to work with and so we settled on Oz Harvest. And so then it all started to fit into place. I'm making a scalable product. I'm using a contract manufacturer. I'm giving half my profits to Oz Harvest. But more than that, um, it's, I soon worked out it might take us a while to become profitable as a startup, which mm. is, you know, a normal thing. Mm. And I said to my husband, you know, if we don't succeed with this business and we fail at the first hurdle, I'll have given nothing back and I've done all of this for nothing. So then um, I was talking to um, a group called Social Traders who um, certify social enterprises as, you know, they're actually giving back what they say they do. And they said, oh, no, no, but you can give on your way. That's fine too. So before you become profitable, you decide how much you want to give out of every product and that way you're actually going to be giving as you go as well as giving half your product. Profits. I love that. So I said, oh, perfect. Yeah, perfect. So we give four cents from every tub to Oz Harvest. Now, you might think that doesn't sound like much, but as a startup, as a start, every yeah. cent counts. Absolutely. Um, and we're trying to get profitability as quickly as we can. And then obviously I'll be able to give a lot more once yep. we're highly profitable. Yeah. So that's what we do. We give four cents from every tub to Oz Harvest. And when you look at the how many stores you're in and the mm. scale of the mm. product, four cents is 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 good. It's a great start. Well, we've already given them um, six and a half thousand meals worth of support, and Fantastic. there's another tranche coming in June. Uh, so you know, it's just building and building. Do you know what the fact of the matter is that you've you've got as a business and as a company, you have a social responsibility to give back, absolutely, in whatever capacity you can at yep. this point in time, yep. and that can always change. Is a lot in in terms of the integrity of the product and the brand and you as an individual as well and the importance of that. And I know a little bit about your background just from the research, mm. you know, you're, you're a child of immigrant mm. parents mm. that your father escaped World War Two. Yes. The, you know. So well, he, was, he was actually a Holocaust survivor. He, he was, was a Holocaust survivor. He was a young um, child um, during World War Two, and he was in hiding. Oh, wow. Um, almost got caught by the Nazis but got into a safe house thanks to Raoul Wallenberg in Hungary who protected a lot of Jews during yeah. World War Two. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so he was a Holocaust survivor. So you know, and that 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 kind of coming to Australia mm. and setting up a life, um, that that kind of um, that 
gratefulness and graciousness mm. to be um, to be in a country where you have that freedom mm. um, to be able to to provide for your family and not be ostracized mm. you can see that through your work and you can you know and you and how passionate you mm. are, you are I mean you're thinking about if this fails I haven't done anything to give back to the yeah, community yeah. not many people think like that Ros. well that was the whole driver and yeah. we, I'd come from a not-for-profit as well yeah, so my yeah. mindset was there as well my husband and I also have our own foundation so we're very philanthropically minded so it was wasn't such a huge leap for me to say I want to use ice cream to give back somehow yeah, but it yeah. was obviously working out what was the best way to do that yeah um so um anyway so um so, yeah, so COVID basically COVID, yeah so um, you start the business in COVID well so when, did, when did you so COVID hit kind of was, what March, was it? March February March 2020. 2020 yeah 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 so was this when you started so that's literally it was when I started walking around trying to find a contract manufacturer, um, and it was it was it wasn't so easy because um, once we started doing lockdowns, everyone started eating a lot of ice cream. So the actual <laughs> volume of production for ice cream went up in Australia during yeah, COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and so I was very fortunate though because I'm um, we started with one manufacturer, but they were really big, and the, sc- the scales at that point of the startup were really too big for us. Uh, we found a smaller manufacturer, and we were quite fortunate because this particular manufacturer had had a lot of cafe businesses in their portfolio and obviously none of those were running so that business part of their business was gone until wow. COVID you know um, was resolved and we didn't know how long that was going to be. Yeah Melbourne <coughs> people decimated a lot of small businesses and manufacturer, yeah. manufacturing. So they were fine but they had lost a lot of capacity and they had spare capacity basically because mm. they weren't making for cafes anymore not, and they didn't know for how long um, you know we didn't know it was going to be two years and you know my god no. um, so they said you know what um, let's do this they didn't have any um, external products in their portfolio and they said let's do this and they're still a manufacturer um, they've, it's been an amazing um, collaboration um, you know I have I'm teaching them the stuff that I know they're teaching me the stuff about manufacturing um, and they've been sensational and they're, they're Melbourne based Melbourne based where yeah. in Melbourne oh I'm not going to say oh, you can't say okay, okay, but, okay, um, okay. Uh, they're, they're in Melbourne um, oh that's so and they good make them, and they're very very good at what they do they make an amazing product for themselves and now they're making for others and the part that's really nice is because they've worked out that they can do this contract thing now, um, they had done it once before but didn't work as smoothly as they would have liked, um, they're now doing a lot more because they can see they can do it quite well and they're very, very good at what they do. So they're now leveraging their own skills in manufacturing to do more manufacturing and obviously getting more bang for their buck out of their equipment because their capacity is now much greater. Uh, and they're also expanding their factory and lots of exciting things. So good on them. off the back of giving myself a go and there was another brand at the time as well she's also around still um because we um helped them work through this you know how you do this part of being a contract manufacturer they're now really taking on other brands and doing a lot more and really expanding their business which is exciting for me how fantastic so it's a win-win for both yeah absolutely that's um, so good yeah no it's been a terrific partnership um, so so you go so they start manufacturing your product yes and of well it wasn't quite so straightforward because you've got to trial things uh, and yes. we were doing something new which is lactose free which they no one here has done well there is uh, peter's do one one lactose free flavor vanilla um But they're the only ones who know how to do it. No one else does because no one's done it. And there's obviously they're doing lactose-free yogurts now, Mm, lactose-free milks. This is already um, uh, three years ago. So Mm. the knowledge is it wasn't really – and in ice cream, really not at all. Mm. So we're literally starting from scratch. I was obviously using the professor to help me with little issues we were having. And so we really had to bed down this lactose-free process Um, and also to make sure that it was absolutely lactose-free because we want to make that claim. So what we ended up having to do because it was just – steep learning curve our first set of packaging actually says low in lactose on it because we couldn't be sure that with all of this trial and error and things we didn't know that we could nail that lactose free um position every single time yeah Uh, yeah. and it's taken at least two years basically to be able to iron out all the bugs in the process to make sure that that's that every product is lactose free so now we've nailed it um pretty much all our packaging from now on is um I think coffee we're still trying to use up our lactose low in lactose packaging but um pretty much everything is lactose free now um but in the early days there were traces of lactose which doesn't make it lactose free um uh, because yes. it's, it's it's also a biological process we're using yeah, yeah, yeah. you know this um, enzyme lactase to break down the lactose and that's you know it's um 
it's it's a biological process, so it has um, nuances, and yeah. you know it's really hard to nail that down. So we've nailed it down now. We know how to do it. Um, so that was uh, a lot of trial and error. So we're doing trials all through 2020. Uh, we didn't have commercial product yet because I also before you can do product, you've got to have a recipe locked and loaded, and then you do your packaging. So until your recipe is locked down, you don't, you can't get packaging. You can't do packaging. The, nutrition, the nutritional panel has to represent what's in the product. Yeah, so if yeah, you're yeah. playing, changing, mucking around, you don't have a product yet. You can't yeah, yeah. print packaging. And obviously you want to print it at scale because it's cheaper. It's cheaper, yeah. Um, yeah also, yeah. it all has, unfortunately has to all be done in China because we don't have the technology in Australia to do the coating on the paper to stop it from getting wet. So ah. it's got a, a plastic... Uh, PE, they call it uh, polyethylene um, yeah. coating on the inside. That's what make it means it doesn't get wet and soggy because uh, when it starts out as ice cream, it's still a little bit wet. It gets yeah. c- gets frozen, obviously, but yep, it's still yep. a little bit wet to fill the container. That's the other thing that's interesting. It has to be runny at the beginning. Otherwise, it can't fill the container. Ah, Imagine if it's hard. Yes, you can't fill you can't it. can't feel it. No. So it comes out a little bit wet. Not yeah. not runny, but yeah. sort of has flow. Yeah, it flows. Yeah, it can yeah. fill the container. And that technology to cover the um, cardboard or the paper um, is not in Australia. So is it can't it be really? done here. No, oh. I mean, we'd all be doing it. Um, there is a manufacturer who puts silver lining on the inside, which looks terrible. Um, but no. It's been offered to me, but I just don't like the look of it. I don't think you know, we should be using foil for the insides. But yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, it is, that's all we've got here. Okay. So you have to get it from China. The quantities are substantial. So until you've locked your recipe down, you have to. Um, you can't print packaging, so you've got nothing. Wow. So we were furiously doing trials because tr- I wanted product. I wanted product. Um, had you had you locked in any? Um, obviously, because you, you you're doing this at scale. So come my business mind goes into because it goes into play now. So you've locked this at scale. You 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 playing. You've nailed the formula. Yep. Um, have you have you have you signed any contracts with Woolworths or IGO? No, no. So in parallel to all this, we found some other advisors who specialise in taking products to market. Okay. So my first set of advisors were just about manufacturing and product uh, product development, uh, but they weren't. Um, retail guys. Okay. So we've now got some advisors who are specialists in taking product to retail. And so they're tasting all my different flavors and they're telling me what they think is going to sell and what I should start as my first flavors. Because I've got hundreds of flavors I've developed over the years because I've been working as a hobby in ice cream for 10, 11 years. And so, you know, I'll just throw anything in. Um, plus one of the classes we did in the advanced class in Italy was um, savory ice creams, which are a personal favorite of mine because mm. um, they're, so cra- they're so crazy. Um, when you so say savory, cucumber comes to mind. But yeah, <laughs> no, you could do that. But I, like, for example, I've done a pasta sauce one at home, which blows people away. Wow, um, pasta sauce ice cream. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, you're going to have to bring me some a bit, of that. tastes a bit like, um, everyone says, it tastes a bit like um, Heinz tomato soup. Oh, when people taste, go. they go, is that tomato soup? I said, no, no, but you're close. It's pasta sauce. Um, wow. wow. But I do a beer ice cream, which is obviously um, a more savoury style of alcohol. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, the crazier it is, the better I like it. So I've done lots, you know, Vegemite and honeycomb. You know, Vegemite just, and honeycomb? Yep. Yeah. Okay. It's the sky's the limit, really. Can we do another podcast where I get to try? I, you sure. blindfold me, and then I have to pick the flavors yeah, in your totally. ice cream. Oh, absolutely. Can we do one well, of those? I do that. I do that at home. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. That yes, totally. Like a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, so the, so the, the flavor stuff is unlimited for me. So then it comes down to what will sell, and also what can you make that's going to be commercially viable? Because there is price sensitivity in the market for ice cream, and there's a, a price beyond which you really can't go very easily without losing sales because That's there's right. a cap on which people are prepared to spend their money on ice cream. Yeah. And that cap in this country is, around, is basically what the cost is for Ben & Jerry's uh, one pint tubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got to get essentially in under that price point. I mean, there are things that are higher, but they probably don't sell as much. So obviously the higher the price above your sensitive cap, the less you're going to sell. Yeah, so yeah, that's, yeah. that's the decision. So then you're trying to decide what flavours, what fits into the price envelope. So it then, you know, the creativity goes out the window. Well, still a little bit creative because you've got to then be creative trying to get the price into the right cost formula, Yeah, um, which is really frustrating. So my advisor is suggesting, you know, these are the flavours that might run. They love them. They think they're great. So that was what we settled on, the vanilla, the coffee and the vegan chocolate. 
finalising the recipes with the factory and then you get your packaging done. And that takes three months to arrive, basically, from the day. You, so we sent it out um, November 2020. So by February 21, the packaging came back from okay. China. We could start manufacturing. So we didn't really start manufacturing until February 21. So oh, it took wow. a whole year of just trialling and getting recipes right and processes right um, before we could actually lock in the packaging. So that was the limiting step. You couldn't do anything until it was all locked down and then you then you print your packaging, which is substantial. So you know, the minimum because runs. Because you still have to outlay, don't you? Absolutely. From a business perspective yeah. Yeah. and, you know, from an obviously entrepreneurial perspective and for the audience and those who, who are thinking about going into the food mm. manufacturing business, there's still – there's so much work that uh, that needs that, – that you do that you you don't normally realise, yes. like obviously the flavours mm. and then working out your manufacturers, mm. your, your, your printing and all of that sort of and stuff. Costs, and costs. And costs. Yeah. And you're constantly outlaying a cost, outlaying mm. a cost. But also the actual getting the cost right, that you can actually have a, a sellable product that where you can make a profit and you're actually going to have a viable business. So that's been yeah. challenging because I've been throwing everything at this product. It's an expensive product to make. Yeah, so yeah, inulin yeah. is expensive. Um, uh, the... Um, we use both milk and cream, which is expensive. Most other ice creams only use cream and they use um, skim milk powder um, instead of milk. Mm. Um, uh, our flavours are expensive because they're beautiful flavours. We'll get onto the flavours in a minute. Um, so everything is expensive and so trying to get that into the cost envelope and still make money, is, that's, that was part that's of the challenge. Key, it's still yeah. a challenge. That's a formula. That's a spreadsheet. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's an easy spreadsheet, not as hard as the, as the ice cream spreadsheet. Um, uh, so, so that's that's that was the challenge. But then we locked that all in. Um, and interestingly, the flavors that I also wanted to use because I really literally threw the kitchen sink at this product. Um, I wanted to use social enterprises as my flavor suppliers as well. It's a very important part of the sustainability proposition of Alato. And they're not cheap as well. That also has to fit into the cost envelope. So we get um, coffee from Change Coffee who are owned by World Vision. So all of the profits that they make go back to World Vision. Um, and they, they did a sensational decaf. So then the decaf ended up being locked in because I'm actually very sensitive to caffeine. So it was really hard for me to even test the product if it was normal coffee. Mm. My husband, who's a coffee addict, was testing stuff for me, to taste testing. Um, but when I tasted this incredible decaf that Change put out, I just thought, you know what? That's the answer because, first of all, people mainly eat ice cream at night. They don't want to have coffee with caffeine in it. Um, kids but they like, want the flavour. They want the flavour and kids really like it. Um, they can't have it if it's got caffeine in it. So I thought, you know what, we'll be the first decaf product for coffee in the market. And what's and But then the coffee has to be sensational. It has to be really, really good because otherwise, you know, I'm compromising. Um, so... Uh, so then we worked with Change for a while to get the roasting right, to get the flavour right. Um, uh, I had to find a cold brew uh, manufacturer to make the cold brew. Um, because you can't – that's right. You no, well, no, well you can – You basically, I wanted a really strong flavour. Basically, most coffee ice creams use um, instant coffee mm. because to get the flavour – if you just, if you use normal coffee, you're getting you're adding a lot of water into the mix, and um, you know the water's already in the milk and the water's already in the cream, so you can't really don't really have the capacity to add much water. So we've developed, we basically get the cold brew is quite concentrated because if it was normal coffee to get the flavour, I would I wouldn't have any ingredients left. It would all be coffee and there'd be nothing left, mm, no mm. fats, no milks, nothing. So we use we get a, a cold brew guy who does a sort of concentrated form of coffee so that we can still get the flavour that we want, but the a bit less water because the water is coming from the cream and the f and the um, milk. That's right. So um, it so all makes sense. Like when you explain all that chemistry component, mm. the dry ingredients, the mm. wet ingredients, mm. the texture, and all that. Like I'm hearing you now, understanding exactly what you're talking about. Like everything needs to be considered to the nth degree. Absolutely. But that's why I loved it because I'm thinking, why? Why do they use instant coffee? Why aren't they using proper? espresso or whatever apart mm. from cost and it turns out it's the water because you've used all the water up for your coffee flavor you've got nothing left for your fats and um uh and proteins whatever so it's all about getting the balance right of the water to the solids so um anyway so we, so we i locked into the idea of decaf with change um, and they've been a fantastic partner um uh, and then the vanilla was um halala and again i was looking for a vanilla that was a social enterprise and I was really struggling. And then I just was at a food show, food expo, and we're chatting and I'm talking to Halala and, the, and I said, oh, you know, you're in Tonga. They, they are the um, vanilla industry in Tonga. Um, 
you know, what are you doing there? He goes, oh, we give back to the local community, back to the schools, back to the hospitals. And I went, oh, oh my God, that's what, I, you're what I'm looking for. Yeah. So Halala Vanilla, um, which is all from Tonga, uh, they supply my vanilla, both the vanilla extract and the uh, vanilla pod. Uh, and then um, the chocolate, there's lots of interesting chocolate options, but um, I came across um, Solomon's Gold um, just through um, uh, literally on the internet and just looking at who's doing what. And I started talking to them about their chocolate and the flavour from the Solomon's chocolate is unbelievable. It's got this beautiful smoky taste mm. uh, because it's all volcanic soil there and that um, – the volcanic nature comes through the bean, the cocoa bean, and it adds this incredible smoky flavour to it, which, uh, I mean, I, I'm a chocoholic and so I, I have quite a good palate for chocolate. So most people would say, what's she talking about? But the, no, if, I'm if you line, you. If you line it up yeah. and you compare it with others, you'll see it has this beautiful smoky taste. And I just thought, amazing. When I made it in trial recipes, it tasted out of this world. And so I just said to them, you know, let's do this. And they also give their uh, – they started the chocolate industry in the Solomons and they also support the local, their local communities incredibly. Obviously, fair, fair wages goes without saying, but much more than that. Um, so um, so Solomons tick for the chocolate. So then each of my three flavours are done. I now know where they're coming from and they're all sustainable organisations who are giving back and, you know, supporting their local communities. They, I love how you always go back to your value system. Mm, absolutely. I love that. And I think for a lot of successful businesses, like somewhere along the line we you know uh, and I'm generalizing here is people kind of get caught up in the whole profit and all the rest of it and it tend to cut back on things but you have and you've said this through that through mm. this conversation the whole time you you just will not compromise no, on any absolutely element and not. I think that is so honorable and so integral I love you for that I think that's amazing you well, know, I'm very determined to find a way uh, basically. look you know what and you are yeah. and you know and it's and it, it's right through mm. you know um to the to where you source your your whole ingredients i think that's and it's interesting because i've been asked why aren't i organic and the point is it comes back to the cost of production so Mm. there's so much i want to do and organic would be great and i could do organic but the cost would go up astronomically yeah and so it's all about what can you fit into that cost envelope and for me the giving back was more important than the organic now that might horrify listeners but that's just my value system and that's what i wanted to do so we could do organic and we and, and but then i would have to lose something else so i'd have to lose these amazing flavor supplies um or maybe lose the inulin or i have to lose something because you have to fit within that cost envelope because mm-hmm. no one's going to pay for a product that's too expensive it's so, interesting and you know you're very analytical um in how you you've approached this business as well as a businesswoman mm. as well you, you just said mm. you know if I was to go down the organic realm then I would have to compromise mm. on something else and yep. it, to me it, it's not in line with my values no. and I think that's so important and uh, we've gone we, we don't do organic but we do which was the other way I solved my my own personal dilemma it's a clean product as well so we don't use any chemicals in any mm. part of what we do and not only that but every product we use has to be chemical free in its production and extraction process as well mm. so for example inulin you can find inulin extracted with chemicals we don't use an inulin like that mm. my inulin is extracted basically they boil the inulin out of the um, it's done using sugar cane they boil it out of the sugar cane and then they dehydrate it so that's mm, it mm, it's basically mm. cooking and drying that's it, it yeah, that's yeah. It. it's not going through a whole no, other chemical no, process no. to extract it and I'm looking at another product at the moment a new product where one of the ingredients uses a chemical and I basically said no I'm not using that product. I'm, not, I'm just not going to use it, and I'm going to find another pro- another another flavor, another way of doing it. I'm just not going to use it. Yeah. Uh, anything that's got any chemical, either in the production and extraction process, or obviously in the actual ingredients, is not um, part of um, a lato. And so that's my, how I've dealt with the not doing organic. Is it's still a beautiful, clean product. So we call it a clean label product mm. because it's got no chemicals, preservatives. Um, as I said, even going right back to um, the way the ingredients are extracted or produced, I always go right back. I make sure I get given the manufacturing process for every single ingredient I'm provided with. Obviously, milk, cream, whatever that's, you know, mm-hmm. goes without, they don't need that, but any other ingredient that goes into it. So, um, so even the, as I said, the emulsifier. Uh, so for vegan, we're doing, um, uh, we were using sunflower lecithin as our emulsifier instead of egg yolk because obviously egg yolk is um, an animal-based product. Um, and we've had to switch because uh, who knew 
that all the sunflower lecithin in the world was made in Ukraine. Oh, so that doesn't really? exist anymore. Well, not except at a ridiculous price. So we're now using another product, which is actually quite good, called acacia gum, which comes from the acacia tree. It's from Africa. Again, it's literally just milked out of a tree and extracted. Milked and the, out of a tree? Well, it literally comes from a tree. Wow. So it's a gum. It's like yeah, it flows, yeah, yeah. flows like, out of a like tree. A, yeah, 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 like yeah. a resin sort like of thing. Like a resin, yeah. And so then they turn it into a powder, basically. They just extract the water and turn it into a powder. Um, and that's been very, very effective as an emulsifier. Um, so, but all of these things, you know, they have to be completely chemical free in their extraction as well. So, and that's important. Yeah. I mean, well, it is for me. That's, yeah. So that's I mean, how, it's for all of us. Yes. You know, like understanding understanding this process mm. in, in in such depth and knowing that you know, okay, you may not be organic, but you you use far less chemicals. Well, no in chemicals. Your, no, chemicals no chemicals in in your in your process of delivering or yep. creating a product. So yep. that's just as good as organic. Well, to that's me. that was how I compromised in my yeah. own mind. And giving back yes yeah. um so because I, I, I still would like to have done an organic product on that you know potentially in the future who knows if there's a mm. way of getting a cost model that works mm. um but by making it a clean label product that's satisfying my need to put out something that's um uh you know as good as i can make it and you know without chemicals so yeah uh, so hopefully yeah. the organic people out there will understand the approach i've taken and yeah and, and still, buy my, still buy my product yeah yeah absolutely and appreciate it but okay so you so you've 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 got your products now you've got yep. your four flavors you've got your vanilla uh, your, three at this sorry, stage three, you have got uh, a fourth coming out but there's uh, three vanilla yep. chocolate and also, coffee and coffee yeah um and now you're ready to go to the market so yes. the advisors go right we love it tastes good packaging yep. superb yeah so hat Tell me yeah. about that process. Well, the packaging process was great. We used a really expensive um, uh, uh, design studio because the packaging is everything. Yeah. And so we decided we weren't going to um, pinch and scrape on packaging. Um, and so I will – I'm I'll, quietly agreeing with yeah, you. Yeah, I will put a plug <laughs> out. They're called, they're called um, Chimera and they're actually yeah. in Rip and Lee yeah. and they do some really big brands. Um, yeah. Cobram Oil, um, 5 a.m. Yogurt um, – uh, Kez's Cookies, you know, they're really established and they've been doing, uh, the guy who runs the studio is very, very experienced. And uh, so we had to make some big decisions about packaging, you know, what's it going to look like? What's the messaging? Um, how do we become top of mind to consumers when they don't even know your brand? Because mm. that's the challenge. In the freezer, you've got literally two seconds to get people's to attention. Get people attention, yeah, yeah. So we settled on, there were two dilemmas. Is one, how do you make it um, appealing and knowable to the to the public so they know what your product is even though they don't know who you are? So anyone who looks at our packaging will see we've got this beautiful, delicious scoop of ice cream in a bowl. We decided we'd kind of own the scoop in the bowl look. Mm. Um, but it, immediately people know what it is and mm. they go, oh, in fact, people often said to me, I think I've seen your product before. But what really they're, they're saying is you're an ice cream brand. I know you are because you've got your scoop and your bowl on the cover of your pack. Subconsciously they've, they've registered They're connected. It. Yeah, so, yeah, you yeah. know, because when you buy, you don't really think you're in autopilot. Yeah, so yeah. you've got to kind of feed into that autopilot Um uh while you're, you know, in your two seconds. And, you know, a lot of brands fail because there's no autopilot leading people into the brand to grab it. Oh, retail, retail psychology is a whole nother level. Oh, yeah, it's a particular interest of mine, which is why yeah, yeah. commenting it's a, on uh, it. It's a whole nother level. Yeah. Like, I've had some really interesting uh, – but the other side of my what I do is mm. is, is property and retail spaces. Right, and, right, right. And, and, and food spaces yes. and even, you know, how, you know, things are positioned. On and, shelf, and, uh, absolutely, all, those all things. that. So it's I all important. I definitely appreciate where you're coming from. So that was a that. dilemma. And then the other thing is all these better-for-you features, what's going to happen to them? Mm. So interestingly – um, at the time, I didn't really understand this, but it's been validated many times, is once you put a call out that it's better for you on the pack, people already think it's going to taste disgusting. Yeah. And so we – and so um, Chimera said, you know, trust us. We know this space. No call outs. Beautiful, clean, luxurious product. You're a, a beautiful, indulgent product. Yes, you're a crossover because you've got better for you features in your product, but they're not going on front of pack. Um and uh, they're going to be on the back of the pack. So if people turn the pack around, they'll get a wonderful surprise. But um, you're going for the indulgent market because that's your product. It's a beautiful indulgent product. No call outs. <gasps> How so did you feel about that? Was that well, I'm, I, I trusted their judgment and it's absolutely correct because then the other reason, which was hard cold numbers, the uh, better for you market is 10% of the market. Yeah. The indulgent market is 90%. 
So why am I going – I could go for 10%. I absolutely could. But I much prefer to go for 90%. Yeah. And so that's um, – for our packaging at least, we are pitching to the indulgent market, which is 90% of the market. Interesting. Uh, but because we're a crossover, that ended up being quite advantageous to get listings because everyone – in retail is dealing with this how do we you know what are we going to list that's going to be that's going to satisfy our indulgent people going to satisfy our better for you customers how and so because we're a crossover it's actually and that was, we'll get to that in a minute but that was one of the advantages that we had is that we're not just another indulgent brand we have this whole long feature list and it obviously had quite a good story behind it as well um, and that was very appealing to retailers wow that is, that's, that's... Because the, the other upside is when you have so many features, it means you can also satisfy lots of people in the home. Yeah, yeah. Because everyone's got their picky requirements. So, you know, we, we're gluten-free, nut-free, lactose-free, obviously chemical-free, um, also delicious and yummy. And so, if you've got all these picky eaters in your home, you just buy our products. Yeah. It should keep it's everyone done, happy. We've solved. got vegan, we've got dairy. Solved. Solved. So, we're also, that's another th- reason retailers liked us is because they knew people, if they bought it, would feel satisfied because they could keep everyone in the in the home happy well you, you, you got so you've got the broad consumer mm. yep right yep. you know you haven't narrowed yourself down it's interesting because well it is a, that's a dilemma in itself because now we're having to communicate to lots more people um so um what's that marketing guy we forget his last name seth um, oh, Seth God- God- Godin. Godin. He Godin. says if you market to everyone, you market to no one. And so yeah. that's our, been our dilemma yeah. is we have so many features. So we just, um, you know, in socials, we market to little groups within socials and, um, uh, you know, we try and get publications in niche publications and whatever. So we sort of, we do do a bit of marketing to segments, mm. um, but we also, you know, can, can hold our own in the indulgent market as well. Have you got any data on your consumers? Like what are your it's consumers? It's pretty eclectic. Because um, oh, really? I, I, in the early days, and I still love doing it, I did sampling in stores because that's how you get to hear yeah. how people respond to your product. Very eclectic. Um, How yeah, so? Well, in so, in so basically, first of all, people who come up to you all love ice cream. So you're yeah. sampling, you're saying, come and try some ice cream. They're already there because they most people who don't like ice cream just say, no, 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 no. So you, obviously they have to like ice cream. But, you know, there are grandmothers who are interested in their health. So when you start talking to them about the fact we've got um, 30% less added sugar and – you know, lactose free is irrelevant to most people, but um, but I always throw it in, and they go, oh, "You're lactose free." Um, so there's obviously all of those people. So basically, anyone who's um, interested in their health and love ice cream, um, you know, is interested in our product. But it's a huge spectrum. So you've got you know your grandmothers who are interested in their health, and you've got obviously your millennials who are completely focused on their health. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, and everything in between. Um, students, kids, uh, oh, mums. In fact, obviously. The ones we try and push to you most are mums who are buying stuff for families. Um, and we're not a cheap product um, mm, mm. because of all the reasons I've explained. You know. and, um, so that, but you're uh, not over the top either, if I can say no, that. No, we're, within that price the cap. we're within that price cap. You know, so like, I always say thank God for Ben & Jerry's because they created that price cap. Yeah, um, yeah which the market is prepared to spend up to. Yeah. Um, so, no, no, but we're still an expensive product. Um, and so we do tend to, I think, the bulk of people who buy our product um, are probably um, people buying for families um, at home, mums doing their shopping who want to get something better for their kids and when their kids eat it and they like it. Um, having said that, when I do sampling, I always focus on the kids. I see a kid walking past my eyes right on that <laughs> kid because I know if the kid Come likes here. it, the mum will buy it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So... Um, but, you know, um, uni students who are interested in their health, it's basically um, – but people, sometimes when you're chatting to them, they don't even care. You start talking about, you know, we've got some better for you fish. Oh, no, 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 tell me about the flavours. They couldn't care less about yeah. it. Yeah, does this taste like real chocolate? Yeah, yeah. yeah. where does it come from? It's <laughs> yeah. yummy. You know, yeah. it's all about taste. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I guess that's the other message, I guess, for people interested in getting into the food industry for retail – is you have to focus on taste. I was told that by so many people when we started, it's got to taste amazing. It's got to taste delicious. Otherwise, you're really wasting your time because people, you know, you got you'll find people who buy it, but you're not going to get a really successful, scalable business if no, it doesn't taste good. I agree. Good. I agree. And I think you know what food food's becoming more and more interesting and more and more flavorful, mm. right? So mm. you are you're in a market that is very, very, very competitive, and Absolutely. especially in Australia because we've got access to so many great um, whole food foods, organic mm, foods, mm. great fruit and veg produce, great dairy produce. So you really, really, really need to, um, you know, have 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 a focus on flavour. 
flavour, whatever that is, whether yes. it's an infusion or whether it's just a simple flavour, yes. it, it has to taste like vanilla or it has to taste like cheddar or it has yes. to taste like, you know, chocolate. Um, if you if you can't nail it, it would be pretty hard. Yeah, I would imagine. I'm not in the try. food industry. Don't try. That's my hard. advice is if don't you can't try. nail flavour, don't try. And also the other part of it is you've got to taste better than your competitors. So mm. one of the other techniques that we di- we used to get um, distributors or our, our main distributor um, uh, was that I would line up a blind taste test with my product against the lead competitor flavour equivalent. Um, and I so want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I could, I'll bring it down for you. You can try it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and so they didn't know what they were tasting. And the most powerful part of that selling was that 90% of the time the people trying would pick my product over the competitor. And the competitor was a very, very well-known brand. Oh, wow. Um, and so it was very powerful. I didn't have to do any selling after that because yeah. if they picked all of my three flavours over the competitor, the lead competitor, I'm not talking about some, you know, small brand, lead competitor, um, then they're saying, we've got to have you. Yeah. Um, and this particular our, our, our current our, our distributor, um, all three guys who came actually came to my house to do this, um, all of them picked my product. So it was so big, and they were all united. So how powerful was that? That's amazing. And they just basically said, "We've got to have your product," and you know, on the spot. And, and how fantastic do you feel after all that hard yeah, work, yeah. going through all that training? Yeah. You know, formulas, yeah. calculations, yeah. professors, yeah. Yeah. lockdowns, yeah. manufacturers, all of that for them to turn around and go, "Yeah, no, nah, we want you." That that yeah. that to me would be like, yeah. I've, yeah. Look, it's a process. We'd, we'd spoken to a few others prior to that, but we've done the same thing with all of them, and it's also interesting interesting that um, a few of the other distributors we spoke to, um, they didn't have a united front in liking my flavours over the um, competitor. It was just, I guess, a bit of luck that these three guys all basically said, we all agree yours is better. We've got to have it. So that was extremely powerful, but also pretty risky. Uh, But I was very confident about my um, product. Um, I've also, over the last, you know, 11, 12 years of, of, of developing it, I've got this very um, discerning taste testing team, which are called Friday Night Shabbat Dinner, um, <laughs> where we've got all ages and they're all opinionated. Of and so, are. so I've run many flavours past them. It doesn't pass the Shabbat Dinner test. It doesn't go to market. I love that. Can uh, I so be part of the Shabbat dinner? Test? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I they'll, love they'll that. tell you, they all, and they're always every time. Sounds I'm like um, it sounds like the Yuganovsky um, di- uh, dinner test as well. You know, back well, it's it's always yeah. Every every good idea has landed on the on the dinner table on a Friday night, and then you kind of cross your fingers and your legs and go, "What are they going to tell me?" What are they so, tell but it's me? good. It's great it's feedback because you've got all age. You've got grandparents, yeah. parents, and kids. So I've got the whole spectrum there, and they're all and. They're encouraged to speak their mind and tell me what they think. So I don't think that it doesn't sound. They sound like my family. It doesn't sound like they need a lot of encouragement. No encouragement. <laughs> no, no, no. Very opinionated. Very, um, you know, happy to voice their um, their views at any any um, any time. Yeah. So so that's the other advantage I've had is that I've had some pretty tough um, taste testers um, who give me a very hard time. Plus my husband as well and other friends. I've had lots of friends come and try product. Um, so you know you get to the point where you know you're pretty confident the product's good because yeah. everyone's telling you it's great and they're not just doing you a favor yeah um you know because there's a lot of that there's a i mean there's a lot of that in in many industries um and but you know i mean i'm not familiar with the with the food industry mm. at all mm. but I, I would imagine there is there is a lot of that and you do you want that you know i'm big on criticism and yep. um and I, I'm, i've got a thick skin so i don't yep. care if someone criticizes as long as they don't attack me but you know constructive criticism is always good and i you can always learn from it and go okay because there's always something because you get especially when you're developing a product I'd imagine um, I don't know with my writing something when I'm really zoomed in and focused on something and I miss things purely because I'm, I'm, I'm focused on one a- element of whatever it is that I'm trying to create or produce mm. someone can come in from the outside and go oh hang on you forgot about this or you haven't added this or even just before when you went oh actually just make these few amendments mm. because you, you know uh, and I think that's important in in, in the development of of any product or business or yep. whatever it is yep. that you that you want to do, but you this has been a long journey. Oh yeah, so no, well, how many years? Well, well two thousand eighteen is when I finished at Aussie Med and started. So okay. getting July will be five years. Five years. Yeah, yep. that is that is a that is a and it's full time for five years. Full time. Actually, I took uh, I, I tried to get onto Master Chef. I took a, a couple of months out of that five years, which I didn't succeed in doing. But that's okay. Uh-huh. 
will you go again? <laughs> no, 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 no. Because no, no, actually, once you're you have your own food business, you're not eligible you're not anymore. Eligible? No, okay. no. That was just okay. before we started. <laughs> yeah. No, it was just before I'd started. I said to Benny, "Wouldn't it be great if I got onto MasterChef? That would be great for the brand." Yeah, but yeah. anyway, um, so yes, yeah, so it took two months out of five years to work on that. Wow. Um, because you know you have to develop your recipes for that and all that stuff, so it takes a bit of time. That's why it was a bit of time out. But that was it was interesting. It was fun doing that. Wow. I mean, I didn't get through the audition, but you know, I got through the first round, whatever they what do. What was it like? Was it intimidating? Uh, yeah. Um, what I learned was that when I'm stressed, I have um, my body doesn't cope well because normally. If I'm stressed, it's in my head. Yeah. I never have to put my body through that stress. Yeah, and yeah. I've actually found it quite hard just physically to do it because my, I was shaking oh, and wow. my body's not responding well. Um, so that was one of the observations I'd never seen before because if I do an exam or I'm talking, whatever, it's all in my head. So I can handle the stress in my head. Then it went translated to my body and I'm, you know, I'm a mess. Wow. Uh, physically, I was a mess. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, very, very stressful because you have to do a 60-minute um, cook with, you know, it's a mystery box basically. That's the audition. So you get a bunch of ingredients. Yeah. You don't know what's in no, them. No, well, you know what a mystery box is in MasterChef. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. And you have to do the mystery box, you know, there, 60 minutes, you've got to get something up. Um, and you're in a kitchen you've never been in before and you've got to work out where everything is and you've got 60 minutes and the time just flies. So, um, Oh, my God, I'm nervous for you. Uh, <laughs> but what was interesting, I'm sure they won't be happy if I say this, I did have a sense – that when they test your product and they ask you questions that they had, they were looking for whoever they had gaps. So they've got, a, I think, a, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, a grid of all the ages and um, categories they've got to fill to get that um, multicultural mix that they yes, come with. Yes, yes, yes. So I think once they fill a box and they're looking to fill the other boxes because the dish I put up was fine and they made some ridiculous comment about it and I just thought, you know what? I don't think they're looking for my category today. And I had a girl with me who was stunning, who also did an amazing, really amazing dish. She didn't go past um, the first mystery box. And I thought, well, if she doesn't get in, then they're looking today for a particular they're box for, in the for, category. Because yeah, yeah, um, we were we were in Melbourne and we were about probably the seventh or eighth audition group they'd done already. So they'd already gone tick, 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 tick. So that was my other observation is oh, that you unless go. you're in an empty box – doesn't really matter what you do. I don't think you're going to make it. What did it. you cook out of curiosity? Um, I did a Hungarian dish. I did a, a pancake uh, uh, with a chocolate sauce, a palacinta, they call ah, it. Ah, palacinta. Uh, I know yeah, what a palacinta yeah, is. Yeah. Well, in my it's always got to be quick so, yeah, and yeah, based yeah. on the ingredients that are available yeah, on yeah. the um, – on the table. So nice. um, anyway, nice. so so we digress. Um, but that was, you know, an interesting experience. Oh, good. It's, but that's kind of a blessing in disguise because, uh, you sure. know. You, sure, you, the ride would have yeah. been a different ride. And it, gave you, and it gave you a good insight of, you know, hey, I actually don't need to do that for my brand because your brand does all the talking. No, but it was still, yeah. it would have been nice. It would, it would have been, been nice. a big leg up, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, so uh, we, we were talking about retail before, weren't we? Yeah, so, retail. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so the distributor ended up – we had spoke to a few, but this selling technique of having a blind taste test ended up being very, very powerful and very effective. So anyone out there, if you're looking at getting into the food industry, if you can pull it off, I would highly recommend it as a yeah. selling technique. Wow. Uh, because think about how powerful it is. It is. It's very powerful. How did you – like, how, how did that eventuate? Like when you Well, say I just knew as I was developing each product, it had to be better than the lead – Flavor. Yeah, I just knew that. So I, when I'm when I'm doing my vanilla, I've got the vanillas that are out there that are selling a lot of product in my, you know, right next to mine, and I'm having to make sure it tastes better. Um, but how did you get the three men to come in? And did you just kind of, you know, no, do no, a call so my, no, my 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 retail advisors. Oh, uh, they arranged they, it. Okay, arranged got you. It. Yeah, okay, yeah. Oh no, no, you. I didn't do that. So I okay. also would recommend if you're a newbie like me, you do need good advisors around you to help yeah, you. Yeah, and yeah. my husband and I made a big commitment. We would get surround me with a very, very good experienced team yeah. so that they can make sure I don't make any really stupid mistakes at the beginning. And so I give my brand, brand the best choice, best chance that it has. So hence going to an expensive designer for packaging, having you know guys who are experts in retail hold my hand. It's a very complex area. 
lots of jargon, things I don't understand. Um, and you know, you've got a law background, sure. so, you know, so for someone like you, you've still got a little bit of, well, not a little yeah, bit, Yeah, no, a lot I worked knowledge. in the commercial yeah. world, um, you know, at Telstra, negotiating big deals um, in the IT area. You know, I, you know I'm, I'm street smart when it comes to commercialisation, yeah. Yeah. Um, but retail is completely different. It's nothing like I've been done before. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so, no, I have a team of exceptional advisors around me, and that's one of the reasons why we haven't kind of... Um, um, fallen over and you know tripped at the first hurdle because I've got good people looking out for me. Is that something that you would advise um, with people that are interested in getting into the food manufacturing uh, business is to surround themselves with, all right, maybe obviously for, for depending on their financials mm. and, and what have you, but to try and get the best that they can afford Absolutely. to help them no through question. their journey. No question. Did you find that really, really helpful for yeah, you? Yeah, because, you know, they're they're watching out for me and make sure we don't make stupid mistakes because they've, yeah. they've done them all before themselves. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what essentially we're buying, that experience yeah, yeah, to yeah. avoid, you know, really obvious mistakes. I mean, obviously in hindsight, you still make mistakes. Of course. But they're different ones. They're not the yeah. basic, basic ones, which if only I'd known that. Yeah. I've never said if only I've known that it's all like oh okay um I see how that works now yeah um, yeah because I didn't, didn't quite have the full understanding so my my if you like my mistakes now are more about not having the complete understanding which falls into place in hindsight you go, oh if only I'd realized so even the choice of ice cream my husband and I joke all the time that if I'd realized how hard ice cream is not just in selling but just the logistics of ice cream are a nightmare um <laughs> To get it from A to B in a cold chain without melting, it's just diabolical wow. and really complicated um, yeah, yeah. Uh, because the logistics industry is problematic. Um, a lot of the people who drive don't care. They're, you know, you know, they're doing six jobs, whatever, squeezing it all in. Not a lot of TLC in the logistics industry. No. <laughs> and so, you know, you get product rejected because it's melted. <sighs> Can't use it again once ice cream melts. It's gone. So that so. whole theory of once you take it out of the ice cream and then you can put it back in, that is just... No, 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 you can. can no, you? No, to a point, well, in fact, I'm fortunate my product's got very good melting resistance. We use quite a lot of egg yolk. And so when you melt the product, if you just let it melt, it still ends up having a bit of structure at the end. So it can come back a little bit from the brink, but not, you know, if it's just melted like liquid. No okay. ice cream's coming back. You refreeze it, it's icy. That's your problem. Yeah. It's an yeah. ice block, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because, you know, it's been churned under very, very particular conditions to get the beautiful emulsion and the air and making it all work together. Um, that's not coming back anytime soon when you melt it and refreeze it. Yeah, there you so, go. So we have a lot of my time is spent on logistics um, and trying to get that right. And, you know, two years into it, um, we're still, I'm still learning uh, on the logistics side. That's really hard. What, as a woman um, that has gone through such a massive transition mm. from your background, mm. now understanding it a lot more, to now this huge journey that you've embarked on, and it's a successful journey, and you're doing so well, and I'm so, so, so grateful that you've you've been so transparent with us in this conversation, or with me and, and the audience, um, on, on the entire journey. What are some of the things that really, that, that, that you went, I'm going to throw in the towel, I've had enough? Or did you have any of those moments? Um, no, it's often with the logistics, when I, I mean, we've had some um, large um, pallets of product that have been rejected by Woolworths because oh. the temperature wasn't right because the logistics, um, uh, you know, just simple things like the, the van did a number of stops and we were the last one on the line. So the van was open and the cold diminishes. And so if the cold diminishes, the product's going to melt. And by the time we got to the Woolies at the end, you know, a whole pallet of stock was rejected because it so, was so wrong you temperature. Just throw it out. Yeah, basically, we gave it to Oz Harvest, basically. Oh. Um, yeah, because they won't accept it anymore. Um, so, so that's some of the frustration. Um, so, you know, trying to avoid that. Um, you know, trying to find a company that will do ice cream. Even that is challenging because all of the distributors and the logistics guys know that ice cream is a high risk product and none of them want to do it. So you're actually then limit, limited in who you can use even for logistics and distribution because no one wants to touch ice cream. Do they have, do they have, I'm assuming it would have to be one of those cold vans. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a yeah. frozen van. Yeah, yeah. And, and, it, and there's different types of frozen vans. So we need a van that goes to minus 25 degrees C. Um, ice cream needs to be at minus 18. But when you open and close the doors all the time, it takes a while then for the cold to build up again. So you need a van that can, you know, really literally, you know, super chill essentially the product as they open and close the doors. So it's oh, challenging. Yeah, the, the frozen part, you know, if I knew, that's the one part. 
if I knew how hard Frozen was, I would have done another product for sure because it's really hard. What would you have done? Oh, look, I would have found some other dessert because I'm a dessert queen, maybe. Um, I probably uh, The problem is I wouldn't have had the passion because the journey that I've gone on, you know, if I could find something that had a lot of maths involved, <laughs> chemistry maybe, um, but it is, you know, we joke about, you know, if we'd only realised how hard f- ice cream is. Yeah. Uh, and so well, yeah. I had no idea up until mm. this conversation yes. How, yes. how difficult it is well, to Well, the manufacturing to some extent is the easy part for me because I'm very good at product development after all my experience. But I'm not that there on the road carrying the product around. Yeah, <laughs> I can't yeah. be. I'm relying yeah. on third parties. Yeah. So and that's always hard because yeah. how do you control a little bit? It's, you know, um, and in the early actually. days I was told the best thing for me to do is have my own drivers and do my own thing. But again, you can't afford to do that as a startup. So you've got to rely on third parties. Um, and yeah, so that's that's the logistics part is still um, a piece of the puzzle I'm trying to work out um, cost effectively as well um, because you want to make sure you still have a margin left um, mm. you know, after all these stuff ups and lost product and um, you still got to try and make a profit um, and get towards making a profit and you of know course. again it all comes down to cost. Yeah, yeah, and obviously you know you have a family of your own. Mm. Um, and y- you know you're juggling this 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 huge enterprise now. Like, how do, how do you balance? So I'm lucky. Uh, first of all, I have a very understanding husband um, who knows that I'm obsessed with this, and he um, <laughs> indulges my obsession a lot. Oh bless! Um, also, I don't have any more kids at home. Um, uh, we started this too. essentially um, when my son moved out. Uh, yeah. That's when it started to get full on. Um, obviously, I still we only have one child. I mean, yeah. Still, I support him a lot. You know, as a mum, you always do. Um, but stops. you know, he's not under my feet. Um, uh, so essentially, and we, I have a dog, so the dog probably is the big intrusion, but then <laughs> the dog is um, sanity for me because yeah. I actually walk him three times a day so that well, I can get good. away from all of this. Yeah, because so, you, so, need, you need some you time. Oh, absolutely, it, right, absolutely. You know, and, business, um, business. and just getting out in the fresh air as well I think is um, – fantastic for um you know mental health yeah uh, just walking and and then you know obviously a gorgeous dog who loves and adores you that doesn't hurt either um uh, so the dog actually is part of how i cope because he um grounds me and gets me out of the house three times a day and there's really good research on, on yeah. animals yep. and and, yep. and, all of that. and and how, um, how they affect mm. you know our our emotions mm. and all of that sort of stuff and then a loving husband who allows me to be obsessed with this oh, bless. Uh, you know, I give him um, as much time as I can and he probably would want a lot more and sometimes he gets really frustrated, <laughs> um, you know. Um, uh, That's all right. He should join my husband. They can play golf together. Oh, he doesn't like golf, sadly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I wish. Go play golf. No. Um, uh, so, no, but we, we have we have an uh, arrangement about all the time. There's times where we know we're going to spend together and other times where I'm just, you know, locked away in my study or in the kitchen yeah. mucking around. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, he's been incredibly supportive. That's fantastic. So, so that's – and again, how I manage is because he's he's there, you know, backing me up um, in every possible way. So um, if I had lots of runner kids running around, I think it would be a bit more challenging. Oh, yeah, it's harder, um, much harder. It's uh, doable, but a lot yes. harder. And to be fair, one of the reasons I didn't take on the entrepreneurial role is because of that, because um, you know I knew it would be very all-consuming, and uh, I didn't really have the confidence either the time, the effort available because, you know, you're juggling so many other things. It's yeah. only because I'm freed up now that I really can take this on and make it a success. Yeah. So yeah. apologies to the young women out there who are building businesses. Uh, I take my hat off to you. Um, I don't at least have the kid part of um, – uh, the load, the time load that other other mm. entre- female entrepreneurs do, because you know my son's out of the house and doing his own thing. So yeah, yeah, and it is. Look, you know, and I guess that's why I asked that question because there's mm. a lot of. Uh, I feel like uh, at now more than ever, there's so many more female entrepreneurs that you know starting yeah. businesses and developing you know um, all sorts of different things, and it's it's great. But I also understand also being a female myself and juggling a few hats, how mm. sometimes it can take its toll on you. Yeah, um, both you know emotionally. Physically, physically on your family mm. um and and all the rest of it and it, it is sometimes that finding that sweet spot where you're satisfied and you're you're happy with what you're doing at work and then you also i think for women and I can, mm. i'm generalizing now mm. because i'm sure men's um you know men feel this as well but i feel like um 
for women when we have children especially and we're running our own businesses, uh, there's a lot of guilt that sets in sure. because you spend so much time Absolutely. cultivating. No, constantly, 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 constant you know, guilt. And, and then you go, oh, gosh, you know what, I missed this or um, I only saw, you know, my kid for this amount of time mm. before they went to bed or mm. your husband's calling you going, you know, dinner's cold, when are you coming home and yeah. all that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah, always, always. So, no no but, question. Even, even without having a kid at home, it's still constantly yeah, a battle yeah, with yeah. guilt. And it is having a supportive partner. Yeah. Or someone that's got your back. Yep, absolutely. That is 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 crucial. Um, if you're fortunate <coughs> enough to have that, you know. Um, I have one other little support, which is pretty unique. Um, I have an identical twin sister. Oh well, that's that's it. <laughs> so so I I haven't actually cultivated a lot of friendships since I've been doing this. I've let all my friendships go because I don't have time, and so she's my sounding board often as well. And so something really shitty happens, I'm on the phone to her straight away, as you can imagine. Yeah, oh my yeah. god, um, she's unbelievably supportive as well. She's in Sydney which has been helpful because she also supports some of my activities up there. Um, she holds product for me when I need samples done. Um, uh, she's been incredible. And, you know, we talk about recipes and ideas. She'll send me ideas that she's had. So she's um, also part of my support structure. It's, that's also an incredibly important part of how I do this. It's, it's important. Mm. And she's your twin, so she yeah. understands you on a oh, whole other level. Absolutely. My know? identical twin. So, yeah, yeah, even uh, better. Yeah, yeah. Even better. So, um, so that's why, again, I, it wouldn't be um, as easy or um, manageable if I didn't have her there as a sounding board as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just to conclude mm. um, our, our conversation today, um, obviously there's new flavours yes. coming out. Yes, yes. Um, and um, so we're excited to, to try those. Yes. So um, but to buy your product, I know you can buy it online. Yes. Um, so it's elvato.com. Elato.com. Elato. Elato. So it's gelato without the G. Yep. Um, elato.com.au. Um, and we sell it through um, all metro supermarkets as well as um, over 300 plus independent supermarkets around the country. Yep. Um, the online is available through uh, Metro 60 because Metro run their own online business yep. um, and also Uber Eats, but that's also through Metro 60. Uh, some of the independent supermarkets have their own online thing, but they're all, you know, it's not integrated. It's just, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. very patchwork. So, yep, so yep. Your, your local independent supermarket might have online if they sell a lato, then you'll know if they have online or not. Um, so we're hoping um, uh, to get into Woolworths supermarkets too soon. Uh, we, it's um, something we're, you know, um, working towards to the bigger supermarkets. We're also actually in um, quite a few um, supermarkets, uh, Woolworths supermarkets that have kosher freezers because our product's also um, fully kosher and we're working on getting a halal certification as well. So th I think Coles in Elston Week um, has got it. Yeah, we're not in Coles, so we're only in Woolworths. Oh, you're only in Woolworths. Yeah, okay. so we're in Balaclava at the, the Woolworths uh, uh, there in Balaclava. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Glen Huntley uh, Woolworths, we're in the kosher freezer uh, Malvern, we're in the kosher freezer there, and in Sydney, um, Double Bay, Bono Junction, East Gardens, and St Ives. Um, so we're also we're in, but in the kosher freezer, so you have to go and find us there. Yeah, 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 uh, but, yeah. Um, but we know we're growing all the time. Um, you know, getting more interest. Um, uh, so then we're in four hundred stores, almost four hundred stores around that's the country. Phenomenal. Yeah. Four hundred. Well, stores. when you have a good distributor, that's what's possible. That um, is that's, phenomenal. I think that is one of the keys to the puzzle is having a good distributor um, to get you into those stores. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some of them the distributors aren't as good as others, so. Yeah. Other than determination mm. and grit mm. for our young entrepreneurs mm. out there listening to this podcast and your diverse background in law and chemistry and obviously ice cream manufacturing, mm. what is the one thing that you can um, share with, with them as – in, in their journey, Re retail gold. I think it still comes down to taste. The product has to taste amazing. Yeah. If you've got an amazing tasting product, you've got a huge potential there. And then second part, I've already mentioned, it's got to taste better than the lead product or different. Yeah. I mean, it could be a different, a whole new approach, a whole new niche, a whole new segment. I mean, that's challenging if it's new because then you've got to educate people about what you are. So I think that's. Mm. I think. If you're going to start out, I think you're much better off going into an existing category and trying to be better than everyone else in that category for whatever reason. So that would be my tip because if you are, you taste better and you are better, then the product will sell itself. 
Yeah. Then it's just about marketing, getting getting it out there and getting people tasting it. Um, and the other thing is sampling is really important to find good sampling opportunities. Um, obviously, you know, I've done a lot myself. I've paid others to go do sampling for me. Um, but what was a really interesting sampling opportunity is we sponsored a film festival because mm-hmm. ice cream and film go oh, well together. Goes hand in hand, yeah. And so what I didn't realise is, you know how you have to have, you know, seven or eight times um, – a brand to hit you in the face before you start to recognise it. Mm. So I didn't realise that people go to film festivals, they see multiple films. And so the ad, we had an ad running in the film festival and they would, and it was just before the film started, which was great. So they kept seeing my ad over and over again with reinforcement and then we were selling the ice cream um, at the candy bar. So that turned out to be huge for wow. building our brand. And it was wow, sort of fantastic. serendipity. My husband said, oh, film, film, we've got to do cinemas. Um and we decided we'd, we'd, we did a cinema campaign, which was just general. We didn't sell product, which was nothing. But then when we sold product in the candy bar at the film festival, that was huge. Wow. So, again, you know, again, it doesn't matter much what the product is. If you can sell it at a cinema as part of a festival, then that's, I think, a huge opportunity a as huge well. branding Because you're getting that repetition as people yeah, see multiple yeah. films. And obviously you've got to get an ad made. That's good advice. That's I mean, we, we, good well, advice. I was also lucky with the ad. Um, my son's... Um, uh, just finished film school and so his mates are all amazing filmmakers. <laughs> and Send so, him over here. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. So one of his most outstanding colleagues came and did the ad with us and oh, I wrote please. the ad. I'm the talent in it. You'll see it on our website. Um, and he filmed it and it was, it was amazing. It was so well done and it looks – someone said to me, how much did you pay for that ad, 100000 That's the one on your website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah, that yeah. ran in the cinemas. Wow. Um, you know, nothing like that. Yeah, that's so good. That's so good. Yeah, so uh, anyway, that, that's the only problem with doing a cinema ad is you need to get an ad made. But I would highly recommend a film student because they, they know what they're doing. Oh, look, you know what? And they're so – film students – any students actually, mm. uh, especially uh, that have just come out um, mm. uh, of their – you know, are itching to, 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 to pull yeah, make that their knowledge. Oh, and their creativity. In, and creativity oh, into, into yeah. the world. And, I yeah, yeah, I'm a big advocate for them as well. And mm. I, I actually quite like them because they have – haven't been um, they haven't been pigeonholed just yet. Yes. So well, I'll put a plug out because this guy he's going to go places. Go for it. Um, his name is Jackson Hayat, H A Y A T. He's extraordinary, um, and he's really going to go places. I mean, my son's Gideon Aroni. He's going to also go places potentially. <laughs> but um, Jackson's a filmmaker extraordinaire. Like he's a cinematographer with the most incredible eye. So oh, bless. Anyway, oh, Jackson, so come wants, and come yeah. and do some video work here he with will. us at Casper Studio. Happily. He'll happily. Come, come and give yeah. us some tips and pointers. Yeah, he's <laughs> exceptional. Oh, good. Uh, so. Anyway, so so, um, so that's just another little tip um, that holds – if you've got a food that can be sold in cinemas, I think that's a great opportunity. That's Not a, a great cheap exercise, but it has the required return on investment. You're getting that repetitious – um, view of your ad and then obviously the products available at the candy bar. That's really good advice, very helpful advice, mm. especially when you when your budget's tight and you're yep. really trying to work out where's, where? the, where's the best place yep. to spend yep. this money that I'm going to get return. Yes. Um, and I think that's your, you, you nailed it in terms mm. of food and the cinema and of course, you know, especially when you're sitting there and you're watching all those ads. Mm. Uh, Great idea. Uh, I mean, the other thing, I think Metro have been extraordinary for us as well. They've been extremely supportive. We actually won the Metro Supplier of the Year last year. Wow. Uh, first time they've ever given that, that award. Too. Yeah, and they've wow. been incredible. And they're doing so many new things which are exciting. They've got their own everyday reward program now just for Metro, which is a really nice way of getting product in front of people via email. If anyone who subscribes to Woolworths, mm, they mm. get everyday reward emails. Now Metro is doing their own um, because if you go into the big supermarkets, it's very expensive to do all of that. And so yeah, Metro yeah. is a lot more cost effective. So, um, you know, if you can find a product and pitch it to Metro, uh, I, mean, I think um, Coles have got their equivalent, Coles Local, but much, much smaller. Much, much smaller. Uh, it's not the same. Metro's um, Metro's a lot more eff- – oh, they're, they're, uh, they're a lot – they're better stocked. Yeah, and they the, actually the curate each um, store particular for particular areas. It's yeah, quite yeah, yeah. It's like heavily curated um, uh, listing of products they have in their stores, which is also nice. So then it really appeals to local local communities. Mm. Uh, so they've also been um, exceptional. So again, if you can get into Metro, um, uh, you know you have to turn up um, and. Um, uh, pitch to them, um, which is you know, part of the process. Yeah, of course. Uh, but they they're very very keen to um, support uh, new brands, and they they like our brand because we're giving back. And interestingly, it's the reason we started with Woolworths because they support Oz Harvest, as so do we. Uh, so there was a bit of a synergy there. Um, so they've also been hugely helpful, and they've they're now, they're now offering all these um, really exciting advertising opportunities that are not going to break the bank. 
That's fantastic. So that's, you know, you've got to get your brand out there. It's got to be known and you obviously got to fit within a budget. So, yeah, yeah so a big plug for Metro. Um, they've been um, incredible partners to work with and build the brand. That's so good to know. We love Metro. We've got some really good Metros around us. Mm. Um, actually, there's one, one up the road. road. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good one, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, Roz, thank you, thank you, thank you for being so open um, and honest and just taking, taking us on this ice cream journey which I absolutely love um, and I can't wait now I, I think you have you are going to be responsible for my ice cream snobbery from Ooh, now on fine, um, I'm fine with that <laughs> so um, it's got a spoon inside the lid for that one I um, have you well but you can obviously use your own spoon no problem um, now the only thing I'm going to say is the Dixie cups are really challenging to fill and so the fig is more at the bottom for the Dixies for the um, the bigger tubs it fills beautifully that's why you get the ripple the whole way through uh, but this one as a word of warning yes very nice um, this is awesome okay so you oh, can yeah. see the top of it doesn't have a lot of figs so you have to really dig to the bottom that's why i got to be oh, yeah, so yeah, this yeah. does have a yeah, it does have a spoon, spoon inside the lid, yeah for those dixie cups so delicious you got some yeah, got some so, yeah, yeah i can see this is like look <laughs> it's so creamy and it's so not it's not overwhelmingly sweet, sweet no Mm. Oh my gosh, this is so good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for just bringing these. No, no, well, I'm <laughs> Thank you for trying just... to promote the fig a little bit because it's this new. Is, this is worth travelling to Sydney for. Oh, I'm great. going to Sydney Thanks. next month. Thanks. And I'm going <laughs> <Amazing. laughs> to see if I can ship some down. This is such a yummy, yummy product. Isn't it great? Oh, it's so good. Yeah. It's so good. So um, I don't take credit for the fig. Um, that's um, the girls from Sister Works. It's their recipe and they're genius. But... You can taste the cinnamon. You can taste the cardamom, but it's not overpowering. No. Sometimes with Middle Eastern desserts, I love Middle Eastern desserts, mm. um, but sometimes I do find that some some flavors come through a lot stronger. Yes, than well, rose water and things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is um, this is really, really, really yummy.